with a lot of information and a lot of input and a lot of discussion today. Um, I want to keep the introduction short uh, so that we can get going and uh, conclude at least uh, no later than four o'clock. So to start, why don't we quickly go around the table, identify ourselves for presence, and anybody on the phone can then follow up identifying themselves. This is Rick McCornack, chair of the group, and let me go to my left. Sure, Haley Davis from Manat. And yes, you remembered to push your little red button. Hi, I'm Joseph Ray with Manat. Rachel Quinn, Healthcare Authority. Hi, I'm Brad Finnegan, a consultant working with HCA. Allison Bailey, I'm with Multicare Health System and here on behalf of the Pierce County ACH. Alan Fisher, United Healthcare. Armas Chabazian, International Community Health Services in King County. <laughs> Joe, CEO, Kitsap Mental Health, representing the Olympic ACH. Uh, Paul Gable, coordinator here. Susan McLaughlin, Executive Director of the King County ACH. Stacey Kessel, Community Health Center, Washington. Rhonda Hoff, Yakima Neighborhood Health Services, representing the Greater Columbia ACH. Andrew Nelson, Molina Healthcare, Washington. Terry Card, Greater Lakes Mental Health Care in Pierce County. Find the red button. Francie Chalmers, a pediatrician, independent practice, and also representing Washington Chapter AAP and PEDS TCPI. Mark Walker, I'm with uh, Providence Health and Services with Better Health Together and Greater Columbia ACH. Emily Transu with the Healthcare Authority. JD Fisher, also with the Healthcare Authority. Keely Klein, Healthcare Authority. Mark Providence, Healthcare Authority. And are there any folks on the phone today? We do have people on the phone. We've got Chase Napier, Jennifer Christus, John Doyle, um, Lee Long, Je uh, Michael Vanderland, Tom Martin, Stuart Satterby, and then Alicia Bassinet. Okay, so I think seven people I counted, seven or eight people. Good, great, good attendance, thank you. Um, I think what we will do, uh, is launched right into the agenda. And Mark, you want to take over? I um, am relieved that everybody made it through the summer, despite hurricanes, ash, and other things that have gotten in our way and other people's way. Um, we're all safe, so that's good. So let's um, stay focused. We have a lot of work in front of us over the next few months. Uh, this is complicated work. I think we have been uh, taking it easy on everybody um, at a level that uh, is not contentious and hopefully we can keep it that way in terms of uh, you know negotiating through very difficult issues um, from all sides of the industry and this is really in my mind the beginning of that process so let's dive in thanks uh, I have a very easy task and that's to introduce JD who's going to take us through um, uh, set of slides on the uh, VVP survey update. There is a slide, I guess I shouldn't overlook this, in terms of our meeting objectives, um, which you can all read here. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to JD. All right. Thanks, Mark. Um, so I wanted to take some time this morning to update the group oh, perfect. on uh, where we are in uh, regarding the value-based purchasing survey that we issued this summer uh, provide you mainly an update on the MCO version and the provider version of the survey with a very brief update on the commercial sur commercial payer survey uh, I want to note before we get started that this analysis is incomplete and very um, kind of preliminary high level we're not doing much in the way of um, regional breakdowns or uh, breaking down the analysis by provider size or anything like that. We want to wait till the survey closes, which is tomorrow. So um, this is all this data presented uh, today is complete as of last week. So we've received some surveys this week that are not included or represented by the data I'll be walking through. So just to level set 
uh, the purpose of these surveys that we are issuing. Again, we've issued three surveys over this summer. Um, one, the first was specific to the managed care organizations, and then the next two were to the commercial health plans and Medicare plans and uh, providers across the state. And there are multiple purposes and goals to these surveys. The first and foremost is continuing our efforts to track progress towards meeting our goals of paying for value in, our, in the state, and that's both through state-financed healthcare and also commercially funded care. And so we started this type of tracking last year with a, a similar survey um, and are going to carry that forward this year um, and are issuing it as we did last year to all state health plans, both um, in the Medicaid space and commercial and Medicare, and then uh, broadly to providers. This year, we are taking a different approach with the provider survey and doing more uh, stakeholder-based outreach to provider groups. Um, this group in particular has been very helpful in promoting that survey and uh, recruiting participation. So I want to thank you for those of you who have uh, stepped up into that role. Um, originally, this survey was just kind of blanket issued through our normal communication platforms, and we got responses from mostly large provider systems. And considering the Medicaid transformation demonstration work and the Accountable Communities of Health, uh, we wanted to make sure that more rural and smaller providers were represented and engaged in the process. Um, and we uh, expect that the results from these surveys, particularly from the managed care organizations and the providers, will help inform much of that work that the ACHs are engaged with, uh, particularly with the project planning and much as they plan for the VVP incentives under the demonstration. Um, so again, just a, a timeline of how the surveys were released. The MCO survey was, uh, released first and closed um, in mid end of July. Uh, we received responses from all five MCOs. Uh, the commercial pair survey was released uh, shortly thereafter and closed on August 31st. And we're still uh, wrapping up some of those responses. We've uh, got most of the responses in, but um, are hoping to uh, reach out to a few remainders that uh, have not submitted responses and try to get uh, more complete data from the commercial side. And the provider survey, um, we extended that deadline till tomorrow, September 8th, um, and I have been continually receiving submissions. And this, uh, as of last week, we had 43, but as I looked at the um, inbox for the survey this morning, we have about 20 more. So we're going to be um, at least over 60 in total, which is great. Um, I think that is an encouraging sign and um, going to be a lot of useful information to pull from there. And encouragingly, uh, we did add a question to the end of the survey that asked whether or not the respondent was willing to allow us to share their particular response with their accountable communities of health. And uh, a large majority of the respondents are willing to have their their um, individual response shared. So I think that will also prove useful to the regions. Um, again, uh, just a, a refresher on the purpose, as I stated earlier, to track progress towards our goals, um, to establish a baseline for value-based purchasing attainment um, for incentives under the demonstration, and also to track progress towards uh, meeting targets under the 1% withhold that uh, the MCOs have in their contracts. And I want to make one note on the MCO survey analysis thus far. Uh, it is a little bit limited due to some incompleteness from uh, one of the MCO responses. So you'll see that reflected in the analysis. Um, and we can speak more to that uh, as we move forward. So starting with the MCO survey and um, using the uh, payments by value-based purchasing category, and just a reminder, we're using the HCP LAN framework that they released for um, alternative payment models. And I know there was a refresh done this summer, but we're sticking with the original framework for now. Um, so um, no, doesn't really matter for this survey and these high level categories. They're largely consistent. So, um, but we just wanna 
make the call out that we're sticking with the original framework. So uh, the reason this data is represented this way um, is that uh, we were unable to get regional responses from each MCO uh, and for one particular MCO we only got uh, categories three and four uh, as a statewide result and so we're only able to break down the results in a statewide fashion so you see that represented here and um, we are so far unable to do a regional breakdown of the payments made and we're unable to break down categories three and four. Uh, needless to say we can estimate where we are relative to our paying for value goals as we are seeking to uh, move the needle on categories 2C through 4B. So as you can see on this graph, uh, MCOs report about 28% of payments to providers currently exist in, or as of uh, calendar year 2016, exist in categories 2C through 4B. So still about uh, just over 70% remains in fee-for-service. Onto the covered lives portion, and uh, this is this graph is only representative of four of the five MCOs. Um, one MCO did not give us any of the information on this uh, particular uh, graph. And one thing to note that lives in this uh, question can be counted multiple times. So if a client sees multiple providers um, in multiple regions. Um, those providers might engage in different types of payment arrangements that exist in different categories and that client could be associated with multiple uh, payment arrangements. So that's why uh, you see a difference in, I'll just go back to the first graph, so you see that, there we go, that only you know a very small proportion of the payments are in 2C, but you see a lot of covered lives represented in 2C and in 2D. And that could, um, you know, is likely due to the fact that clients that see providers in those categories are mostly seeing and most of their payments are being made under other arrangements. And uh, also note this graph is in the thousands, so in that category one fee-for-service, when it says 5,635, that's really five million. And so, you know, we don't have um, that many Apple Health clients across the state, so it's really a proportional kind of where our where are people going? Um, and so the numbers aren't going to be a one-to-one -one for how many covered lives there are or how many Apple Health clients there are. Um, it's more of a representative sample of, of where clients are going. So question, the, the data actually is dirty then. I mean, it's not, you have unduplicated. This really is more of a gee whiz. We have a partial participation by MCOs. I mean, for the covered lives especially, yes. Where, where are you going with the value of what we're doing here then, as far as this survey? I mean, isn't it being undermined now as a result of that? Uh, we definitely have less complete information than we hoped. That is well, yeah, you have true. compromised data. So, how, how, okay. So with the with the covered lives, it was never, this this particular question was never intended to be some, you know, highly, one one client is represented in one category. This was more uh, peripheral information. The payments, however, we were hoping to get much more detailed um, and complete information. So it is completely accurate that we are hamstrung in what we were able to use this information for. Uh, we asked for uh, most our top five enablers and barriers to engaging in value-based purchasing arrangements. Um, and these, uh, we asked MCOs to rank them one to five. The most commonly cited enabler was trusted partnerships and collaboration. Um, that next was aligned incentives in, in contracts. Then payment model, uh, this text got cut off here, but um, payment model technical assistance. And then inter interoperability of data and then aligned quality measurements and definitions of qu what quality means. The top five barriers were uh, disparate incentives or contract requirements, um, lack of interoperability in data systems, la a lack of collaboration, um, a lack of consumer engagement, and disparate quality measures or definitions. So there's some comparisons here. When, when these things go right, you see them in the enablers. 
like aligned quality measurements and interoperability. And when those things aren't present, there's significant barriers. So that's, that's an interesting takeaway from that. We asked about uh, quality metrics and how they're being implemented in contracts across the state, particularly our MCOs seeking to align with the state, our MCOs seeking to have consistent quality measures in all their contracts across the state and with their uh, contracted providers. And then if, if there's any efforts to align with other entities beyond uh, what the healthcare authority is doing. So four or five MCOs responded affirmatively to using the same set of quality measures in all their contracts, with the fifth saying that there is a good deal of overlap. Um, all five MCOs uh, stated affirmatively that they are uh, making efforts to align with the state's common measure set. And two of the five MCOs uh, spoke affirmatively of aligning with uh, quality measures um, of outside entities. Um, and then one additional MCOs are engaging in conversation about uh, doing something like that. So I think this is good. I think there's, I mean, we there are a lot of measures in the quality measures and this common measure set. So there still could be some variability in the measures being used, but this is a good sign that there is, um, you know, movement to align with uh, with with the state and across uh, provider contracts. The last question we asked was about any services that are traditionally rendered by the managed care organization that are being delegated to contracted providers particularly care coordination, quality management, utilization management, provider network management, and provider payments. And four or five MCOs answered affirmatively that they are delegating some care coordination and quality management to provider groups. And only one of the five MCOs uh, reported um, delegating util utilization management, uh, provider network management, or provider payments to those provider contracted groups. So that's the end of the MCO survey analysis for today. Is there Are there any other questions before we move on to the provider groups? Yeah. I'll ask a question and you can tell me if you, um, because I'm just a guest here, if this has been covered and we can take it offline. But I'm curious, um, given that the majority of the regions have not moved to fully integrated managed care, whether you plan to survey the BHOs, because um, a number of them are in uh, value-based payment arrangements with their providers as well. And when I think about sort of the state targets, how's that going to be factored in? Well, that's a good question. And we have not talked about surveying the BHOs as of now. Um, that is something we should consider moving forward, particularly since there are a few mid-adopter regions potentially, but um, you know, by 2020, there's going to be some gaps there. So we'll take that back. We do expect to get um, a good amount of behavioral health and behavioral provider behavioral health providers responding to the provider survey and we've already seen a good deal of that um, but we wouldn't have it from the payer side so do i take your response to mean that you will survey the bho's i don't want to commit to that but we'll definitely consider it and talk about it um, uh, and i don't think we would do it this year at this point in time so i would highly suggest that you do because i when you because that was a big factor into your targets and might give a better sense of where you, you know with your numbers and where you need to be and where regions need to be yeah, so. absolutely we want to I, I, does this committee make uh, as an advisory board i guess can make any recommendations or can we do that mark what, what are your thoughts or do we Remain silent on the topic. No, uh, given that, that there hasn't been silence on the topic, I think we'll we'll take that away as a as a recommendation from this group if if that's the case. I don't see anybody disagreeing, so it just makes good sense, folks, if we're gonna have an actual baseline of all the different payer systems in the state as we know it to actually be inclusive of the current payers, MCOs and BHOs and I guess we can take it from there. So, yeah, thanks, Joe. And and uh, uh, I don't want to get my you know colleague. I don't want to get killed by my colleagues by promising that we're going to you know tomorrow set out to survey the BHOs. I think we'll have to talk about just how we would pull that off uh, at this point. But I mean, we do hear the recommendation. I'll do it if you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> Careful what you volunteer for. Uh, any other questions before we move on? 
I had a quick question. Um, I totally understand the differences and the gaps between the dollars that are spent in the different categories as well as in the number of lives that are in the different categories, not just data issues, but just why those would be different and it makes sense that they're different based on how you explained it. One of the questions that has come up a couple of times from both MCL conversations as well as some of the ACH conversations is when we look at hitting the state's number, you know, getting all the way up to 90% in DY5, are there any carve outs of types of spend? Because none of the MCOs that we had talked with had any uh, BBP relationships with pharmacy, for example. And so would 100% of pharmacy dollars be not BBP or would we have to move to pharmacy BBP contracts or are they carved out? I guess that was kind of the question. Um, I'm gonna look to see what Rachel and Mark have to say, but my understanding is that we are not carving out pharmacy. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Not correct. So they not would be, so they'd either so have those to Those dollars to, would. And yeah. it's not, or just to take the example a little further, I think based on the way you explain it, I assume that this is not the way it works, that if a person, an individual, has a primary care position that is in a VVP contract, but still goes to, I'll pick your pharmacy, CVS, and CVS does not have one, that CVS spend doesn't follow mm -hmm. that person who is part of a BVP contract, it's really that pharmacy contract that matters. Unless so, right? the pharmacy is not connected to that contract, okay. then yes. I, that's we a have, great clarification. It's, it's the same, I mean, we have the same challenge in our public employee benefits programs mm -hmm. to move the pharmacy spend into value. So great. understand it's a, a big lift and a lot of unknowns about how to, how to drive value in pharmacy, but it's not our intent to carve it out. Thank just, you for that clarification. Just uh, on that topic, so just to be clear, in the Apple Health contract Exhibit F, which unfortunately I've almost memorized, there is language in the contract to talk about total cost of care for um, payments made under a VBC contract that's uh, um, primary care centric, and um, certain of the HCP land categories allow for the total cost of care for the member to be attributed to value-based if that member is paneled to a um, primary care physician under the value-based contract. So to answer your question then, yes, pharmacy spend on that member would be considered value. Regardless of the level of VVP? The uh, HCP land categories are three and four currently in the contract. Got it, three and four, thank you. Very good. But, but I think this is highlighting, I mean, so Manat spoke with all of the MCOs, um, many of you around the table, and one of the things that we picked up on is kind of a common theme is that there, and not just among the MCOs, but that there's some confusion about what that denominator um, includes. And so I think something that we'll want to talk about um, is, is that, getting clarity and making sure that, that all parties, including the MCOs, but also the ACHs, the providers, et cetera, um, are totally on the same page. Because I think we're hearing, you know, there's confusion. You know, we, we kept hearing um, plans saying, you know, we actually have a significant portion of our of our members in VBP. Well, you know, percent of members different than percent of payment. Um, percent of payment, you know, in terms of, of all dollars out versus dollars associated with an individual, you know, it, it just, it, it depends on the way you cut it. So I think um, just to piggyback on, on the comments there. Okay, so onto the provider survey. Uh, again, Multi-purpose of the survey to track our goals for paying for value and to better inform regional work under the demonstration and inform ACHs as they move forward with their project planning. Uh, again, we extended the deadline to tomorrow and are still receiving responses. As of last week, we had 43. I'd put that number closer to 65 right now. Um, and we made a concerted effort to specifically target uh, administrators of provider organizations to alleviate some burden on clinicians and not uh, make them feel like we're asking them to do another survey. We know they've been experiencing some survey fatigue and I think that effort has been well received and I think due to our collective engagement in that process it's been um, it's worked out pretty well. It's also enabled us to build uh, some contact lists for administrators so we don't have to kind of go through the rigmarole of trying to backdoor into uh, administrative contacts with these groups, which I think will be really helpful moving forward with this and other efforts. 
Um, so starting with some of the results, just based on provider type, um, a large majority of the providers responding are nonprofit groups. Um, the largest specific type is outpatient facilities. Um, we had uh, 15 report and as a, an outpatient facility, uh, 13 FQHCs so far, uh, 11 behavioral health providers, and seven independent multi-provider uh, single specialty practices. So far, as of last week, we didn't have that many large hospital groups respond. We did some direct outreach to a select number of those last week and got uh, received some positive responses with intents to submit responses. So I know sitting in the inbox are a handful and uh, we expect to see uh, good results from those. Um, when we asked about the number of clinicians associated with the group responding, um, most were in the small to mid range um, with the most number of responses at 14 being in the range of 21 to 50. We had, as, as of last week, only three in 1,000 or more, and then six from one, 101 to 500, five from 51 to 100, nine from six to 20, and five zero to five. So a pretty good spread. Uh, I think it's good that we've got 14 responses as of last week um, with 20 or fewer physicians. Um, that's a group we have been unable to reach in these types of survey efforts before, so I think that's encouraging. And I think those are a lot of the groups that um, we're hoping to better engage in some of the work moving forward. When we, uh, I'm sorry, JD. I, yeah. I was just going to, when you did this uh, provider type analysis, one of the things that concerns me has to do with provider size. And um, one of the things that I, I'm really concerned about is the small entities are going to get lost or are going to end up getting shut down as we do this transition because the economy of scale isn't there to accomplish that. Do you have any way of, of did you have any breakout in your data analysis to tell me, I mean, how many, how many small mom and pop shops participated in this? Do you do a um, breakdown by uh, budget numbers, staff numbers? So not in this analysis. Um, we, you know, as I said, this is pretty high level and preliminary. So we wanted to wait till we get, till the survey closes to start doing some of the more detailed cross-referencing and um, cross-categorization, but we'll be able to do that. Well, I express that concern because in my territory, we started like 11, 11 small mom and pop substance use disorder services, just transitioning them over to um, um, where, where we are with value-based payment. Uh, you know, now we're down to like four, you know, they're, they're closing out. And I'm, I'm afraid you're going to lose that if we don't capture that in our first go around. As far as how the landscape is going to shift and change, my concern is that we're going to lose a lot of small niche market at small nonprofits if we don't capture them in the beginning and see what this this is actually doing to an actual economy of scale across uh, communities. Yeah, I mean, thus far, I think I'm encouraged by the number of small groups that have responded, and we'll be able to break that data out by okay. size, by you know total budget, um, okay. by number of clinicians. It's just not represented today. Okay, great. I didn't know we you will we were going to be able to pull that off. And, and we'll be able to do it by region as well. Perfect. So, but but yep. Joe, I think, it's, I think it's a great point, and it's something that we want to talk about today when we get into kind of the second half of the agenda, which is trying to think really about um, smaller rural providers that aren't currently in, you know, robust health systems and, and active in the VBP front, what, what happens to them when we, you know, throw on the, around the word VBP and when we are kind of pushing to get to this 90%, realistically, what, what can we do about that? And so that's, that's going to be actually much of the focus of the second half of the meeting, because uh, I think it's a great point. It's something we've heard loud and clear from speaking with people. We see it obviously outside just Washington, other states too, um, consolidation, you know, not a lot of people aren't happy about, about that as, as um, a teacher. So. Can I ask a quick clarifying question on the um, information on the provider types? When you are using the word number of clinicians, I assume you mean physicians specifically, or is that broad definition of clinicians? Yeah, it was billing providers. So any any type of billing provider. A billing provider, yeah. So an ARNP would fit, an RN typically wouldn't. 
Um, if I can, Joe, back to your comment, it, it makes me think that one uh, useful crosswalk might also be between the size of the practice and the proportion of Medicaid represented in the practice, because those can combine to have a, a, a deeper effect on the small practices, I think. Toward the end of the session, I'd like to reframe your, um, your statements, Joe, in a slightly different framework to see whether it plays uh, with the group, because I think you're raising some key issues that extend beyond your literal meaning. Uh, and I think maybe this is a group to, to deal with some of those questions, but we'll do it toward the end of the discussion. Fair enough. I got a feeling we're on some similar page here, so good. Thank you for allowing yeah. that, that site. That Absolutely. Direction. No, thank you for that question. I think, you know, per, as we move forward to do more in-depth analyses, I would welcome, you know, preferences for how you'd like to see the data, um, and, you know, we'll be able to play with it from here on out. So if we give you something and you'd like to see it in a different way or you'd like to see something else compared, we can happily do that. So thank you for that. Um, we did ask for county of uh, where you were practicing, where the, the provider group was practicing. And then from that information, we extrapolated which ACHs they were present in. So we got pretty good representation across all AC ACHs. Unfortunately, Southwest is a little bit uh, underrepresented with only three responses, uh, but uh, the rest of the ACHs have at least six responses from provider groups, and you know those numbers are going to grow as uh, once we add those 20 or so responses. Was this the primary billing location, or what, what, do, what do we do with clinics across ACH boundaries? So it, what, the question was, where do they practice? Where do they have a clinic, or where is there a, a presence? So not to check a whole mess of boxes. Yeah. So if, if they had clinics in multiple counties, they were able to. And select they would those. be duplicated on this graph then. Mm, no. So if, if a if, practice went, if a practice did five different counties. Oh, they would be duplicated. Yes. If they if so if they were in Seattle and Tacoma they would show up in King and Pierce. Okay. So we, just to give a representation of the money being spent um, and paid to these providers, we just broke out the total revenue by payer type. Uh, in, and this is, these numbers are in the millions. So to, uh, total revenue from self-pay is about 32 million so far. Uh, from commercial, about 1.1, 1.2 billion. Um, other government that's non-Medicaid or Medicare is about 88 million. And Medicare uh, and Medicaid are um, six and 700 million, respectively. And then um, we asked, or this is just a representation of which providers had any revenue reported in categories 2C through 4B. Um, commercial revenue, there were four providers that uh, reported any revenue in 2C through 4B in commercial, five in uh, 2C through 4B in other government spending, then seven and 14 in Medicare and Medicaid, respectively. So some, some room for improvement there. And we'll be able to break that down, you know, by region and et cetera. So we asked about uh, experience thus far in value-based arrangements and how those have gone. Um, for the most part, it's either somewhat positive or positive with uh, just over 60% of respondents who have participated in VBP saying they had a positive uh, experience. 35% were neutral on the topic, and only 4% were uh, very negative or somewhat negative. AD, I presume we're talking specifically about primary care response, viewpoint, worldview. This would be just in general. Mm, really? Interesting. So we also asked for enablers and barriers. We did not ask providers to rank them, just to select those which they found to be enablers or barriers. So the biggest enablers were trusted partnerships and collaboration with the payers, aligned quality measurements and definitions, 
aligned incentives and contract requirements, the ability to understand and analyze payment models, access to comprehensive data on patient populations, and the development of medical home culture with engaged providers. The top barriers were lack of inter interoperable data systems, the lack of availability of timely patient data across populations, the lack of access to comprehensive uh, data on patient populations, the inability to act ad adequately understand and analyze payment models, misaligned quality measurements and definitions, and lack of consumer engagement. So much like the MCO responses, you see some similarities in, in these, and um, I think where you see one in each side, a key, key area to improve when it's showing up as a barrier, that um, aligning quality measurements is shown as, as an enabler and a specific barrier when those quality measures are misaligned. Does this also then, I mean, these when we did the survey, it, it assumes EHRs or medical records, whatever, correct? Uh, I would say it's ambivalent. ambivalent. I don't think we... The, the reason why I bring that up for a twofold, number one is uh, really the, the lack of the state of Washington to have a solid fiber backbone across the state to allow small rural um, behavioral health organizations and the like to actually have uh, a robust EHR system that could actually do the things that we'd like to have done. And then uh, the other part is that it's a huge investment on any agency to do an EHR. And like ours is, we're, we're, we're going next, turning the key for a new one next year. But I mean, what with all the features that we're asking of it is, Everybody else is, is, it's just a constantly evolving market for availability. And any of these things to be really answered is highly contingent on a good EHR. And we don't have a, that I know of, a criteria or, gee whiz, this is a baseline of what you need when you go shopping for an EHR in the state of Washington in order to meet, this is ideally what, what we want you to be able to produce. Do you think that would be something that is that could be considered? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I definitely do. I mean, I think we've heard from various circles that adopt, simply adopting EHRs for many small and rural providers is a challenge in and of itself. And then how well that actually works, particularly with across payers and as they seek to collaborate with other provider groups is definitely challenging. Um, I'd have to look back to the questions to see if EHR adoption or implementation was specifically called out. It may have been, um, it may have been an oversight. Um, so I'd, I'd have to look back into that. I love that idea though of putting together kind of a, you know, a package of what someone should be able to expect from their EHR in, in order to be able to do this. Um, I mean, among other things, if we're all sort of on the same page about what that ought to be, that's a big enough group to potentially influence the EHR developers to put those functionalities in as a standard feature. So I think that's great. And, and just pertinent to the idea of follow-up, um, correct me if I'm wrong, JD, but I think in most cases we do have the contact information of the person who completed the yep. survey, right? Yep. So it does give us an opportunity in the future to get back to folks. So this is a big issue, and it's it's as big with Epic as it is with small vendors who have not updated their software in the last 10 years. And I think um, this voice here is important, particularly as it's making recommendations about value-based payment, that we think about the potential hooks and alignment that can be improved between EHR vendors and what's going on in Washington so that we can protect smaller providers from going down rabbit holes with software that is not going to meet their needs. I'm hearing this loud and clear on the Medicare side with MACRA. So some vendors do well in supporting the smaller practices, others are abysmal. And I think the state has an interest in, or should have an interest in um, less variability here, because ultimately it's going right back to Joe's original question about the usefulness of data. And it's, it's gonna bite us if, if we aren't working all 
avenues of alignment to get the data that we're going to need, which is going to become maybe our biggest bugaboo two or three years down the road. And I suspect we'll hear more about that, talk more about that this afternoon in, in the second half. I mean, I think what, in having some initial conversations with folks, and then of course, uh, in just meeting with many of you over the last few months, that's a common theme. And, and thinking about what the heck could the ACH's role be, understanding they're not going to step in and, and play, you know, a data role per se, but, but also thinking about use of district funds and, and trying to be innovative to avoid just having the answer be consolidation. I mean, I think that that's, um, you know, something that's on everyone's minds and something that we should, uh, Hopefully, I think it will come up in our conversation this afternoon, um, but, but I think it's a really good point too, particularly as we focus on rural, smaller providers. Just a quick comment with regard to the development of these findings as you go forward. On the provider survey stuff, it'd be really helpful to have denominators for some of your categories to really understand how representative this is of, of the numbers of, of the various providers in the state. And I would submit that this group could be uh, very useful in informing kind of some of those recommendations and um, you know, standards, if you will, for providers when seeking to adopt a new EHR. Um, you know, I've, speaking personally, I have zero to none when it comes to expertise on EHRs, so I know they're a challenge. That's about as far as my detailed knowledge goes. So I know Emily probably has <laughs> some experience and can speak to it, but. PTSD. Um, I think there is, um, and there have been discussion in this group earlier of um, the resources that it would take to get a truly, you know, high percentage of all the practices in the state to participate, and, and the outlay of that would have been an extremely expensive and um, resource intensive project that would have kept us from being able to do other things. So I think there is a, a degree to which these are useful qualitative data and um, but that the statistical um, kind of sample to get a, a fully representative sample we're unlikely to get without putting a different kind of resources into it, unfortunately. Brad just pointed out to me that uh, one of the things that we uh, have included as part of our HIT roadmap that we're um, putting together under the demonstration is um, planning and guidance for acquiring and use of health IT. Um, and it also reminds me that, that this, uh, I think, overlaps a bit, at least with some of the work the Practice Transformation Support Hub is doing. So I think there are probably some resources we can call on to uh, try to put that kind of guidance together. All right, and then the last slide is uh, just an expectation for what providers would seek to do in the coming years, uh, or in the coming 12 months, rather, about increasing their participation in VBP. And most respondents said that they would um, increase by at least 10% of their participation in VBP, with only six saying they'd stay the same and one saying they would decrease um, by 10 to 24%. So I think that's an encouraging sign. And that's, this is the last slide, so if there are any questions, I know we're running a little over time, but. I just want, uh, I had to go back to the enablers, and um, when we did the survey, we were actually stymied by the question about development of medical home culture, because as a behavioral health organization, we're not, the state did not endorse or go down that road for behavioral health organizations. Um, Yet we actually advocated for that to happen, but it was not, the state said, no, we're not going to allow you to do that. Do you think that's going to be something that will change to put us on par with um, the medical providers or not? I don't know. I don't think that there's an answer to that, but I, I know that is an active ongoing discussion and, and sort of thinking about in a lot of different forums sort of how to make sure that um, that behavioral health is able to be a, a there's so many different homes and they all overlap and conflict but to be a home um, for patients I, I think is a, is a really high priority so I can't um, answer exactly what that will look like but uh, that is a very alive discussion 
Okay, so do we have any thoughts on, do we want to clarify homes and then perhaps uh, extend the equity of home ownership to all organizations? <laughs> We will yeah, actively, affordable home ownership, I think, is really important here. We will actively combat medical homelessness. Mm -hmm. AD, can you say, oh, go ahead, Someone, um, a little bit more about like what comes next? I think yeah, that'd be great. So uh, survey closes tomorrow, um, so we'll spend a good deal of next week compiling final results and looking over to see if we have any follow-up questions to issue to any respondents, and then we'll start putting some reports together and, and digging deeper into the analysis. And I think uh, we'd like to have something to share by the end of September. Um, I've put a timeline together, but I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. Um, but I think by the end of September, we'd like to have something to share more broadly, um, internally and with this group and with some other close stakeholders. But um, then move to have something that we post publicly and have on the website, but then, you know, welcome um, requests for ongoing analysis. So I think in a couple weeks to a month, you should um, expect to see or hear some uh, more detailed analysis. And I think we would welcome if you had other ideas for analysis. Maybe we can send out a follow-up email to this meeting um, that you would like to see, not customized, but in the the bigger report that will be released to the public. We also intend to, to uh, share results back with ACHs, given that we can uh, uh, look at the data by ACH region. So uh, and we'll probably be having some conversations with the ACH leaders about that. Mark, one of the things that doesn't seem to uh, make sense to me, frankly, is the MCO survey payments by VBP category and the MCO survey covered lives by VBP category, uh, particularly when you look at categories one and 2C, 2D. I mean, those should, I would think, be relatively consistent in terms of percentages. Well, there's, so the first thing I would call out is when you look at the covered lives, there's only four of the five MCOs represented there. So we're missing some data on the covered lives side. And um, the second is that uh, just because that it's not a true one-to-one -one comparison. So um, since a, a patient can see multiple providers that, you know, contract in different um, payment categories, that patient would show up in each category on the covered lives report. But when it comes to the payment side, it's going to look a little different. That was probably not a very good explanation. Can I help? So take take a member and say um, they, get, they get primary care capitation, and that's worth 10% of their premium. So I've got 10% of my dollars for that member sitting in a 3C, let's say. Um, but I've got the other 90%, which is my hospital payments, my pharmacy, everything else, fee for service. That member is in both, right? But I have a huge amount of dollars sitting in fee for service because all my hospital claims, all my pharmacy claims are sitting over there. Yeah, no, I'm I'm with you. I just think if you look at the ratios on the covered lives, you add them three and four, and it's about 25%, and the payments is about 27%. You look at 2A and 2B, it's about 1% of covered lives and about 0% of payment. Those are kind of the same things. And so you look at category one, it's 71 versus 48, and one versus 27. I'm just saying that just... I think there might be something there that probably warrants further analysis, at the very least. Because yeah. if, if we are double counting, that, that's not going to be helpful at the end of the day, if that, in fact, is the case, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, I think part of the challenge is just the, the incompleteness of, of the data. Um, you know, only being able to look at the payment information with on a statewide basis and combining categories three and four, um, it's just hamstrings the level of detail we can dig into. Um, but yeah, I agree there's, you know, going back and forth between the covered lives and the payments, it might add more confusion than clarity. So I'll have to look into it. Thanks. Go to you next. Thanks, JD. So I'm going to uh, go the same route that Mark did and uh, 
introduce Haley to go ahead and go over the next uh, version of what we're going to go over. Just right before we do, I wanted to say that our last meeting, we got a lot of really good feedback that people really enjoyed the breakout groups. And so we wanted to put together an exercise today that would kind of re bring that concept of, together again of uh, breakout groups to uh, discuss some information, but we kind of put a little twist on it. So for that twist and for the scenario that we've developed for us to talk about today, I'll hand it over to Haley. Um, okay, there we go. Um, so, as Joseph said, it, those of you that participated last time around, you know, Manat did a presentation um, on DVP capabilities that providers need, I should say, capabilities that providers need to be successful in DVP. Um, we then had a breakout session where, you know, folks got together, um, you know, focused on a specific capability area, provided feedback. Um, a quick note that we've uh, revised that capability um, framework, uh, the slides that were initially presented, um, and kind of finalized it as today, going out to ACHs um, shortly, I think. Monday. Um, Monday. Yep, there you go, Monday. Um, and it can certainly be sent out to this group um, if it hasn't already. But um, very quickly, um, you know, instead of us presenting this time around, we thought it would be um, better to get uh, perspectives from across the industry um, coming up here, or actually staying put but using the microphone, um, and presenting um, their uh, viewpoints uh, in response to a specific uh, VBP-related uh, scenario. Um, so before we, we dive into this scenario, I'll do a quick kind of overview of what um, of, of the, the goals of this exercise, if you will. Uh, but just to say that um, we're still going to have this, this sort of presentation component and then a reaction, a, a, a few moments. Um, to react in, in, in the form of a breakout session. Uh, and similar to last time, we'll, we'll also have a kind of five minutes for each group to um, have a, a representative from the group stand up and, and give um, a summary briefly of, of the real takeaways from that, from that discussion. Um, so goals of this exercise. Um, one of the things we didn't discuss up front, but we're initially planning on discussing, uh, were these things called, and I know ACHs are familiar with this, but um, regional VBP strategies, um, the ACHs have to, to put together in the coming months and years. Um, the goals of these regional VBP strategies are to, for ACHs to develop, um, are to identify um, strategies to be implemented in each region to, to support attainment of those ambitious VBP goals, those targets, that 90% by the end of district year five that we were talking about. Um, it's also to define really a path for each region um, toward DVP, how can we get from, from where we are currently to where we need to be um, at the end of district year five um, that is, in, in theory, kind of truly reflective of, of your region. So that's, that's something that ACHs need to do. Um, again, these are called VB, regional VBP strategies. Um, I believe they're due to the state um, by the end of district year two, um, which is next year, so end of 2018. So it's not due tomorrow, but as we think about, um, you know, what would be helpful to get um, ACHs and all of their stakeholders and partners thinking about um, really the, the VVP strategy uh, at the regional level. Um, we we thought uh, you know informing that strategy earlier rather than later was a good thing, and that this exercise, hopefully today, these presentations, these perspectives from some of you, um, and then the time to reflect um, would be um, you know worth it. Um, so informing, thinking, uh, and planning for these regional VVP strategies is one of the the goals that's mentioned on the slide. Another is, is something you'll, it, it probably sounds like we're a broken record, but helping um, the ACHs understand their role in all of this. We keep coming back to that with each of these meetings because I think, you know, there's still not clarity, um, up, you know, by anyone on, on what exactly the ACHs should be doing with respect to VBP. Um, we keep hearing that loud and clear. So I think, you know, putting our brains together to, to think about, um, you know, developing that, expanding upon the ACH role. Um, is, is really a good thing and, and still worth, worth the effort. So those are the two goals for this exercise. Um, before I get into the actual scenario, I'll just say um, that, that we, we basically we have four folks um, that are going to be um, providing their perspectives in response to the scenario. One of them is an eight, um, MCO representative. Uh, we have two provider representatives today uh, reflecting behavioral health providers uh, and independent pediatricians. Um, and we have one ACH representative uh, that we're very excited to have uh, with the group today. Um, so if we, let me see, the next slide, there we go, sorry, um, goes into this, this you know, scenario, if you will, which I'll just say is completely hypothetical. Um, but we do think that 
that while made up, um, it's, it's somewhat reflective of reality based on, on both the MCO survey results that we just went through, but also all of the conversations that we've had with the MCOs uh, and with some of the uh, larger providers as well. Um, that really is, you know, one of the key themes we, we keep coming across is that VVP to date has really focused on larger providers. So that is health systems, hospitals, hospital affiliated uh, provider groups, large FQHCs, um, that they've, um, I think one, one MCO representative put it as have kind of been the low hanging fruit with respect to VVP. They've got more resources. They've got more experience in this. They, they've, they've got a greater level of sophistication. It makes sense. They've also got, you know, more Medicaid lives. It makes sense that, that MCOs would be going there first, um, to, to, uh, enter into VVP contracts or VBCs, um, uh, with with those providers, but and, and we think that that'll get you that'll get you somewhere, right? I mean, we're already seeing uh, what about 28% of of uh, payments, uh, Medicaid payments in those categories, categories 2C and up. I could be misquoting, but I think that was it. It was around the 28%, and that's for last year. Uh, so expecting more this year and more next year. Um, so at the bottom of the slide, which I don't know if folks have this in front of them, but um, you know, district year one, which is today, this year, we've got a goal of 30% of, of payments in, in those categories 2C and up. We feel somewhat optimistic about meeting that goal, right? And, and pretty much all of the MCOs we spoke with felt pretty good about that too. Um, and, and largely on the backs of these larger uh, providers, the low hanging fruit, if you will. Um, looking to next year, that 30% goes up pretty drastically to 50%. I think there was still some optimism uh, on, on the part of MCOs. Um, but 50% is, you know, we're not there now. Um, we'll see in next year's survey, um, you know, how we are uh, based on 2017 numbers. Um, but I'll just point out that the subset goal, there's kind of, the, the as we get into subsequent distrib year, um, you have this, this second row in the table here that is in categories just three and four, so higher levels of EBP. 10% um, of, of payments need to be in that um, subset threshold or target, um, that seems like we're already blowing past that too because of these larger providers, right? We already have, I think, 27% in categories three and four just in last year. So, so we feel pretty good about, you know, district year one threshold, part of district year two, but then you start looking at the, uh, these numbers creep up pretty quickly in subsequent years, which are really right around the corner, and you think, well, how are we going to get there? Um, and it can't just all be on the backs of, of the larger providers which is really getting, getting me to the point here, this scenario, and to much of the conversation raised by you, Joe, you know, thinking about other providers, bringing them into the VBP continuum. So focusing on, on the, the larger providers won't get you where we need to go um, in the end. Um, so we're gonna need to bring in other providers, that is unaffiliated, smaller, um, you know, rural, um, you know, other provider types, behavioral health providers, for example, um, bringing them into VBP, how are we gonna do that? Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, we have this hypothetical region um, that, that is very much in the place that I just described. On track to meet district year one, uh, 30%. On track to meet that sub-threshold for district year two, but not looking to be on track to meet the overall 50% of VBP in, in categories 2C and, and up, um, and, and definitely not on track to meet subsequent years. Um, so how can we get them to do so um, by focusing less on on the the higher hanging excuse me the low hanging fruit if you will and starting to think about bringing other provider types in? So finally, um, we have a couple questions for consideration, and these are the questions that each of our presenters are going to be responding to. Um, that's the goal anyway. They're also what we you know as you're listening to the presentations, we want you to be thinking about uh, at these two questions, uh, and they're going to very much be. Uh, what the breakout sessions focus on as well. And one is, I think I already touched on it, what can be done to bring in more providers? So those unaffiliated, those smaller, those rural providers um, into VDP contracting. And that doesn't mean taking on risk necessarily. You'll recall in much of our earlier work when we went through the HCP land framework, that could just be, you know, pay for performance. Uh, you know, uh, it could be T 2C and 3A, which I think are upside only um, contracts. Um, that's important to remember. Um, and then also, again, importantly, what should the ACH be doing to support these efforts? So what can be done? You know, we can start thinking about by whom, because I, you know, I think we'd all um, understand that pretty much everyone has a role in this. MCOs have a role, providers have a role, the ACHs have a role. But then specifically, what can the ACHs do? We want to really narrow in on, on that may vary by region, but generally, how can they use district funds? Um, how can they help support um, bringing those new providers in, into the VPP continuum? 
Um, so we are a little bit over time, but still pretty good on track. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to, we're going to go with first the MCO present presenter, which is Stacey Kessel, and I'll open it up. Do you want to? I just want to say one thing before we get started. We've allowed about 10 minutes each for these um, presentations. Mm -hmm. We don't want to make this portion the interactive portion, so we'll let each presenter do their 10 minutes. The breakout groups will then go and discuss what they heard, what resonates with them, what doesn't resonate, what's missing, should be added. And then when we bring the breakout groups back together to present uh, their thoughts on the sum total of everything, then we'll have a little bit more interaction and depending on the time. Yeah, so exactly. So just about 10 minutes for each each presenter. We're going to start with Stacy. Um, from Stacy, we'll go to Terry Card, um, who's going to be our behavioral health um, provider representative. Then we're going to go to Francie Chalmers, uh, our pediatric representative. Um, and then we'll go to Susan McLaughlin, um, uh, our ACH representative. So, and then again, we'll have about 45 minutes to go through the um, breakout session process. Um, and then also uh, that includes kind of presenting uh, or just uh, debriefing on, on each of the, the groups, group talks. So with that, um, Stacy, and I should say very quickly, Stacy. I'm sorry, I keep pausing. Are, are there any questions up front about the scenario before we dive in, or was it pretty clear? Actually, I, I just have one observation of, of the scenario, and, and given the lead time for a contract negotiation, yeah. as we think about DY1, DY2, DY3, it actually puts a little bit more urgency around getting those uh, agreements in place. That's a great point. That's a great point, Mark. All right, with that, Stacy, take it away. Thank All you. Right. Yeah, you bet. Um, okay, so I think uh, through introductions, you know, I work for Community Health Plan of Washington. We were started by FQHCs in the state of Washington about 25 years ago. Um, there's 19 community health centers that are members um, of Community Health Network of Washington. We have population full risk contracts with uh, most of our community health centers. And when you look at the survey that was done in 16, we were only doing that kind of work for Apple Health Family. So. We've expanded that to our other products, um, and you know that that puts that's kind of our low-hanging fruit, right, for us. So we've we've got those risk contracts um, out there with each of our individual um, community health centers. So to look at these questions, um, high-hanging fruit. Um, one thing we do, one thing we can do, is look at the metrics that HCA has put us at risk for, and um, look at those smaller providers and offer some sort of performance. Uh, enhancement or incentive to, to meet those metrics. So pediatrics strikes me, right? There's well child visits that were um, responsible to meet certain metrics. So if we put um, a performance incentive out for even the smaller pediatric groups or other primary care docs that are at serving children, that's one way that I think we could um, get at some of that higher hanging fruit. I think from an ACH perspective on that, um, Right now, those our other groups have the ability and have the funding to put programs together that they're going to outreach and do more work to try to get those kids in. As an MCO, and I'll just say it, be controversial a little bit, we're not looking to spend money to have something done that was going to be done anyway, right? So I'm wanting that actually more well child visits are going to happen if I put that, that group at risk. If there's enough dollars at a bigger group, they're going to do something, right, to try to make that happen. The smaller group, is there really enough resource there for them to do that? This is where I think the ACH could get involved. The types of programs they can understand from those larger groups, from all the health plans, what, what, in, what activities get put in place that actually drive up those well child visits? Is it that you're at the schools and um, you know promoting well child visits? Do you have certain programs where um, you're offering immunizations uh, even for the younger kids, if they bring them to the schools or to fairs or something like that. So where a larger group can maybe put on something like that, the smaller groups probably can't afford to do that on their own. So perhaps ACHs could participate in kind of convening that and um, staffing that. And then the performance goes up. You can look to the MCO to provide the incentive payment um, that the district funds through the ACH could be used to really um, move forward those activities and the education about the importance of the immunizations and about the importance of the uh, preventative care, well child visits. So um, that was one. Um, another thought was region, the regional rate development. So we just had a meeting last week with the healthcare authority in Milliman to talk about uh, rates for 2018. And something new that the state's doing this year is that they're rating 
based on RSA, based on ACH region, right? And that, that's not how rating's been done before. It was a mishmash of counties. For those of you that don't see it, <laughs> mishmash of counties, it varied by each product, by family, BD, and expansion. Um, so this year, it's going to be by ACH. What that means is Milliman is developing very detailed cost models for each HC ACH. I think as an ACH, you could use some funds to analyze that data and understand where there are variances from that ACH to the rest of the state on cost or utilization from different categories. So really to help target potential opportunities. Let's take from that, let's say e ER within your ACH is really high. And this is where Rick told me it was okay if I was a little controversial. So. Okay, so here's one thing, and I'm going to just step a little far out with this one. Uh, if ER is high in your region, what if we set up, and again, the ACH needing to fund this, because the small groups aren't going to do it, um, fund having a triage service available at the hospital. And the hospital, they, the, the member presents, and they do an EMTALA screening, and I think that happens, but they treat the patient right there. So a lot of you are going to say this is not very patient-centric, and we can talk about pros and cons, but the idea would be if it's not an emergent situation, you don't actually treat the patient there. You send them off to triage, triage provides them some education, helps them connect with the appropriate provider, be it a mental health provider, be it a PCP, whatever it might be, and they actually help contact them and set up appointments. Your providers in the area have to be willing to say, I'm going to have appointments available the next day to see these folks if they're coming after hours, right, so that they can get them in there. And the providers have to be willing then to provide education about being the medical home for them, about when they should use the ER, when they should use um, the, the clinic. We've seen a lot of expansion folks not go to the doctor at all. And we had a, a big incentive last year um, for our community health centers to reach out to these folks, go find them and get them in for a visit. Very common, what we heard back was, they said, I'm not sick, I'm not coming in. They don't know that they have, they don't know the importance of it, and I'm, I know I'm generalizing, so a lot of them convey. They don't know the importance of preventative care, and they don't understand that they have coverage for that. They think they have to be sick to go in, because a lot of these folks have never had insurance coverage before. So again, part of that, their, their mentality is to go to the ER. So it's a whole retraining, and um, but as long as you're going to see them, they're going to go back, right? So it's about changing the behavior. Maybe initially you could argue that it's not patient-centric. In the long run, hopefully you're getting them the right care, right, in the right setting. I think everybody says the hospital is the worst place, right, as far as getting sick. <laughs> so don't be there, right? Let's get them into the medical home and provide the preventative care. So I'm... Um, I don't, there's not a lot of hospitals right here, right? So they don't love me. But the ACH, right, could be using district funds to help fund the hospital for that lost revenue, too, right? A lot of them are going to want that, right? They're going to say, I don't want to promote this. I need the, the money. Well, part of the funding could be to, as many as they triaged out, that there's some sort of incentive for them out of the district funds. It's funding the triage folks. You build that education and that, that knowledge, and then you take it from there. Okay, that's my big idea. <laughs> Thank you, Stacey. That was great. Um, and also right on time, so very well done. Um, so next, let's go over to Terry. Um, Terry, you want to do an introduction to you at the beginning? Sure. Great. Um, I'm Terry Card. I'm with Greater Lakes Mental Health Care. And we're in Pierce County, and so we do have a little bit different situation than um, the behavioral health providers in other counties, other regions. Uh, we have Optum, and they are a... Uh, for-profit uh, company. They're part of United Healthcare or United Health Group. Um, and they've got some fairly sophisticated contracting um, methodology that they use. And so part of what they've done is um, for the last several contracts, we've had um, uh, incentives for increasing uh, penetration and uh, disincentives for failing to increase penetration. Um, also, we've had incentives and disincentives for volume of service delivered, and so we have we have already been in a situation where we have had to go at risk. And at one point in the fiscal year that just ended, June 30th, we were um, down by about 
uh, 700,000 um, that we would only get, that we had, we had, that those were services we had provided, but until we hit a certain penetration threshold, we were not going to be paid for those. Um, so we've had some experience with that and some experience in what sort of um, infrastructure you need to be able to analyze those contracts and then design the metrics uh, and the, the reporting that will help you stay on track. Um, so, you know, that that's a challenge that we have worked with the last several years and we've gotten fairly good at it, but I, I know what went into that. So just wanted to give that background before I launch in. I went ahead and wrote, typed out my stuff just so I wouldn't ramble um, and waste time. But um, so when I look at these categories, um, category two, C and D, uh, what I think about is that you need a certain degree of size for that organization because um, they have to have the expertise on board to map that out, to create the metrics and the reports, um, to work with operations to make sure that clinical operation adjustments are made uh, in real time as necessary to get there. Um, the other thing is that where we were able to go at risk for, uh, you know, six, seven hundred thousand dollars, uh, a smaller organization would not have been able to. And we had to have conversations with our board in advance because we said if we fail, um, you know, this is a big hit to the bottom line. And um, so they were with us and they monitored the performance going forward. But a smaller organization could potentially look at a contract like that. First of all, it took us a month of analysis just to figure out that's what it would do. Um, and so a smaller organization might not have that sophistication. Um, and a smaller organization almost certainly wouldn't have had the kind of CFO level expertise uh, to map that out uh, to, to work with the management on, on the outcomes. Um, let's see. So moving on to category three, uh, APMs with upside uh, gain sharing and upside gain sharing and downside risk. Um, when you get into this category, I think it's going to be challenging for a standalone behavioral health center to have sufficient information to evaluate whether a contract's viable for their organization or not. Um, so keep in mind that the physical health providers have most of the most important information. Uh, the MCOs have almost all of that information, at least for their, their people. Um, but the MCOs across the country, what we're uh, hearing a lot is that they're sharing the information that they have to in order to contract with providers, but they're not giving providers all the access, all the information that they could use to improve their services. Um, so for behavioral health providers, that essentially means that they're operating with a, a fairly small window into the data that will allow them to be effective. Um, also, behavioral health providers are acutely aware that they can have a, a pretty positive impact on physical health status, um, but they're also aware that they have to take uh, significant risks at their level um, with only a small savings with those. Um, and they, again, they only get the information that's shared with them. Um, again, in this category, there's increased need for sophisticated contract and data analysis. Um, and again, because many of the behavioral health centers have been systematically underfunded for years, um, they lack a lot of the experience and the uh, sophistication associated with either uh, uh, um, a hospital level CFO uh, or decision support managers or that kind of uh, a person. So with that kind of experience. Uh, moving into category four, um, I look at the data again and the question for me is, is there any way to get the data that you would need other than consolidation? Um, and for smaller organizations, how could that happen? Um, and one of the things that we would look at is that, you know, at our team, we talked about if there was a statewide database that we were able to uh, operate uh, and tap into, uh, that would provide us some comfort that, that we could operate more at that level. But the way it is with category four, um, now, when you start looking at population-based payment, you really have to have some size. Um, and, you know, Greater Lakes, we have a little bit more than 50% of all the Medicaid outpatient behavioral health uh, in Pierce County. Um, but we're no, we don't believe we're anywhere near the size that would have to be to do population-based payment. Um, and so all of the comments from the, three, the previous categories still apply, but now there's the challenge of the 
size threshold um, that you'd need to have, uh, and the robust data system, the EHR, that includes all of the physical healthcare data, um, as well as the behavioral healthcare data. And so an, an HIE that relied on, you know, any kind of individual ROI just wouldn't, wouldn't be effective. You really have to have that population-based uh, uh, access to the data. Um, so when we look at category four, our team couldn't figure out how they could be effective without consolidating with a hospital system. Um, and so, you know, I, I know that that's, that's out there as one of the options that behavioral health providers have, um, but it may be the only option they have if there's a push to get us to, to that category. Uh, the question of what our ACH could do to support our efforts, um, that's where I struggled um, in part because um, I know that uh, the ACHs in some cases are talking about playing a, a central role in data management um, and uh, at least speaking for our organization, um, you know, we, we would feel very comfortable with the state playing a role of that level, but less comfortable sharing proprietary data with ACHs. Um, and so we're not quite sure how they would help. I loved Stacy's suggestion that they could um, be extremely useful in analyzing the, um, the Milliman data uh, and giving us strengths and weaknesses by region and giving us uh, you know, Optum has done a lot of that so that they help point providers in the right direction. But um, we'll lose that. We'll lose that system-wide view when uh, the BHOs go away. And so I think that's a great idea. Um, and I'm open to, to any other ideas uh, as we discuss this further in terms of how they can be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Um, let's move over to Francie uh, to give the pediatric um, perspective. All right, um, so um, just a little background. Um, I have uh, been an uh, independent, medium-sized practice, pediatric uh, specific practice for 30 years. And I would say five years ago, I had, I couldn't speak this vocabulary at all. I was seeing patients. I was the managing partner of my practice, but we, um, you know, we have, I did not have a CFO level administrator. Um, we really focused on being the best patient-centered medical home we could, but it wasn't formalized and um, we saw patients and we did provided the best care. I became aware of the need to, that this train was coming along and decided to find ways to educate myself. But I would argue that most Many practices um, that are small to medium sized independent practices, I've called them SMIPs um, for fun, uh, is, uh, are really, um, especially in the pediatric world, and I'm going to focus more on pediatrics, um, uh, really not very aware of what's going on. Um, they don't know uh, the language. They don't even know the alphabet. Uh, they certainly don't have a handle on all the acronyms. And they are um, <clears throat> seeing this as one other thing they have to do. Like first it was meaningful use, and then it was ICD-10, and now it's this MVP something. Um, so uh, the other thing that uh, is significant for um, uh, pediatric practices is that they really don't, uh, pediatricians, uh, children are not the cost uh, centers for healthcare. Um, the work that pediatricians do in the preventive arena um, will reduce costs 30 years later, but it's going to be very difficult to measure uh, benefit uh, in a pediatric population uh, clinic. Um, the cost in pediatrics is really random. It's not something that can be controlled by how the providers um, practice. It's things like congenital anomalies and kids with um, multiple chronic illnesses that spend their days at tertiary centers, um, premature babies. It's not something that we really can control. The main place that pediatricians have control is in the ER utilization, probably, um, and in ensuring high levels of preventive care services. Uh, the other uh, significant impact on um, pediatric costs is uh, the um, ACEs and social determinants of health, which impact uh, um, the needs of children and their ultimate health. Again, not something that we have a lot of, that pediatricians have a lot of control over. 
so at the same time, I think there's still uh, inherently a significant value to uh, somehow allowing the independent practices to survive. I, I believe they serve a real role in the overall uh, healthcare arena. And I, um, I think it would be unfortunate uh, if the system that is developed really makes it untenable for that. Um, but right now, an independent practice doesn't have uh, the financial, uh, the capital to uh, develop the infrastructure that's required um, to to do data empanelment and data analysis and hire care coordinators and hire uh, behavioral health consultants and <clears throat> do behavioral health integration without some kind of support. Um, and I would argue that uh, the, co the healthcare community, uh, with the help of the ACHs, is a place where that support could be provided. Primary care providers within a larger entity are supported by their larger entity. And um, in some way, I would love to see the, the um, healthcare infrastructure support the survival of independent practices. Um, so what, what has to be done to, to um, first attract the interest of those providers um, and then engage them and provide them the support needed for them to participate in value-based contracts. Um, I think the first, the first thing and the most significant is education. Uh, they need to be <clears throat> um, enticed to see the value of learning about value-based care uh, and value-based contracting. And um, right now, the, the um, pediatric um, TCPI and other TCPI programs are, are actually making some significant strides in that arena. Um, the clinics that are part or providers that are part of TCPI are getting a lot of education about um, uh, value-based care. They're getting education about behavioral health integration opportunities, um, uh, the whole spectrum of that from um, uh, improving communication between the, the, the uh, medical care and the behavioral health uh, entities to all the way to um, co-location. Um, that education has taken the form of workshops and forums, uh, webinars, websites with lots of resources. The UW uh, portal is certainly one uh, that is providing resources and there's been work between the uh, PEDS-CCPI and the UW portal to try to make that more pediatric focused or have more pediatric content there. Um, that sort of support is going to go away when uh, TCPI ends in another year and a half. And um, I think that's a great opportunity for the ACH to take on that responsibility of providing education uh, in uh, various modalities. Um, the next thing that, that is needed is infrastructure support, uh, whether that's um, uh, consulting support or financial support. Um, again, that is happening right now through PEDS TCPI. Um, several practices have had practice facilitators come out and train them on impanelment and data management and um, QI measures. Uh, and again, that can be uh, something that the ACHs take on as the um, <clears throat> PEDS TCPI ends. Um, the other thing that needs to happen is we need to start right now measuring the value of the changes that we're looking at making. Um, ag again, because the uh, cost savings is not going to be immediate in pediatrics, we need to ha be setting up a structure whereby we're measuring where we're at now and, and look at it over the long term and where are we in 30 years and has this been effective. So setting up some kind of um, a uh, statewide database, I think, would be uh, really essential in that regard. And then uh, sustainability. Um, the ACH's support is going to go away eventually as well. Uh, so um, how do we uh, create a system for practices that allow them uh, to be able to contract in a sustainable way with uh, MCOs? Uh, such that the shared savings um, continues. I think the ideal um, primary care practice structure would be um, less 
uh, fewer patient visits, um, that, but those that occur being capitated with um, a support infrastructure support that would allow uh, physicians time to be on the phone with patients um, would ha allow for uh, more, much more robust care coordination and referral coordination and uh, the ability to integrate behavioral health into the practice. Um, and ultimately, I think through support of the ACH, in the meantime, we ought to be able to get to the point where those practices can be sustainable. Thank you so much. Um, so we were going to have um, a, a third provider representative um, speaking to the, the rural perspective. Unfortunately, she couldn't make it at the last minute. So um, we're going to skip right ahead to our ACH representative. But I will say, um, as we're breaking out into the, the breakout sessions, to the extent that anyone um, from representing rural providers here or those of you MCOs that work with rural providers, which I think is most of you, can kind of channel that, ACH representatives that are here too as well, I'm thinking about, uh, we really want to bring that into it. Um, you know, we've, we've heard from independent providers, behavioral health providers, again, just one perspective from each of those, um, understanding, uh, not speaking for all, but uh, but trying to channel the, the rural piece to this too, because we think that's a critical uh, piece uh, as well. So let's go ahead and go straight to the ACH uh, representative here, who is not actually part of our MVP action team, so we're very pleased to have her um, today. Um, Susan McLaughlin, you can uh, provide a little bit of an introduction um, and also to the extent uh, you're comfortable perhaps responding to some of the, the roles that have already been called out for you uh, in, in the previous presentation. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, it, it's good to be here. So again, my, I'm Susan McLaughlin. I'm the executive director of the King County ACH. And in full disclosure, this is only the fifth week of my job. So fairly new to the ACH world, but um, have been very seeped in this uh, topic and this work for a number of years in my previous role. I was with King County government. I was in the Department of Community and Human Services and had um, a leadership role in our the, uh, operating the behavioral health organization and led the transition from RSNs and, and uh, substance use disorder and fee-for-service over into managed care. So, um, and have been involved in the evolving of our King County ACH as well. So, I'm happy to share my perspectives on this with regard to the kinds of things that need to be done. I mean, I think I'll just kind of reiterate and maybe elaborate on a couple of the points that were made. I think first and foremost, going out the door, this is going to need to be a very collaborative effort between managed care organizations and the providers and the ACH. You heard earlier that we have this deliver deliverable of creating a regional VBP strategy. Um, by the end of 2018. I, I think we probably need to get it done by the end of 2017. Um, but we really need to do that and go out front uh, really aligned with what where we want to focus priorities, um, aligning with the metrics and the outcomes that we want to focus on, and, um, and then uh, really engage providers around the, um, I really appreciated the slides earlier around what are the enabling factors and what are the barriers. And to get a good sense of that of that and build from it. I think that the we're, there's going to need to be a lot of very targeted work with more, some uh, most of the smaller and more independent um, practices. I really appreciate your comments, Francis, that you were making about what it takes. Um, re reaching out, really providing some in-depth education um, and understanding of what it means to do, uh, to do value-based payment, what are the capacities that are needed to operate in that environment. Uh, we've started some of that work in King County. We started with our behavioral health system about uh, six months ago and doing some readiness assessment for providers um, and actually looking to divide providers into cohorts based on where they're at um, in having the capabilities and the infrastructure and the readiness to move forward um, and moving providers forward in phases. I think that's something that we can look at as a region and as a system. I think the other thing, and, and I'll probably say this multiple times um, in my 10 minutes, just to reiterate this, the issue with um, the smaller providers and um, business models and capacities and what it takes to really do value-based payments. So to Joe's point earlier, um, putting in front of them what options and opportunities there are for them to look at around their business models and um, affiliations and partnerships. And, you know, we, I don't think we want, um, I know we don't want, uh, you know, mergers into these big health systems and lose the richness of 
the smaller providers. It's fundamentally an equity issue as well. Um, if we start to lose that specialty care, we have a lot of small providers in our region that um, uh, have lots of uh, cultural expertise and serve certain populations, and we went, would not want to lose that richness. And so I think providers need to understand what kinds of arrangements they can enter into that allow them to share risk, um, but also allow them to have some uh, independence and autonomy uh, for the work that they do. Um, in terms of the ACH role, I mean, I think um, folks have raised a lot of uh, what I see as, as a lot of um, the important roles for the ACH. Certainly, we can, um, we're a convener. Um, we can be bringing together providers and MCOs to develop strategies. We will um, be working to engage providers anyway to be part of the demonstration project. And um, this, the value-based payment is just another sort of layer of that engagement. And so having some focused attention on that. Um, the ACHS uh, certainly, uh, I think, can pr have a role in education, training, and coaching providers kind of along the lines of what I was just talking about, about what does that mean to be in value-based payment arrangements, what does it take, what are the capacities and infrastructures that providers are going to need um, to be ready, and, um, and beginning to coach them and maybe, again, doing it in phases. I think the ACHs, the um, strategy around the project design and how we develop our portfolio is another key way that, that the ACHs can help with this. Um, I think, uh, Stacey, you were alluding to it earlier, but um, how we design our projects across the domains, um, we can design them in such a way that they begin to lend themselves to value-based payment arrangements, and um, and then we can actually do even small tests of that through our, our various project designs, the integration one, but some of the chronic disease models and so forth as well. Um, and then how we um, uh, build in, kind of implement the standards standards of practice and then tie payment to that. So we can um, distribute funds, the ACHs can, that are really tied to models that help agencies and organizations make that shift from fee-for-service payment structures to value-based payment. Um, and then again, aligning the, the metrics and the outcomes for various projects to the value-based payment arrangements. And then finally, the other thing that I would say that ACH is one of the roles that we could have is helping um, support agencies in making that uh, transition from fee-for-service to value-based payment and some of the ways that I think have been alluded to um, uh, by the way we use our incentive funding. And so, for example, supporting some of that revenue loss or that business model change. So, for example, in King County, when we moved the substance use disorder treatment system from fee-for-service into managed care and in King County, the BHO actually paid through a case rate. Um, so we moved substance use treatment from fee-for-service to case rate. We actually provided um, quite a bit of financial support um, as agencies shifted their business model because they were used to that volume flow of payments. And then the case rate payment operates more like a per member per month payment structure. And so making that shift, there needed to be some kind of steady flow of funding to support that um, until the, the agencies could get used to just the more PM, PM shift. I think that some of the incentive money can be used to help support that uh, business practice shift as well. Um, and then we've talked a little bit about infrastructure, what, it, what it's going to need um, to bring in the, um, the data infrastructure and technology infrastructure for uh, practice um, and population health management tools and through the domain one strategies of the projects, um, that's a place where ACHs can also help invest in infrastructure um, to support that. And I think looking at, there's going to need to be um, some look listening to this conversation at how we distribute those funds um, appropriately to the providers that are um, have the least amount of capacity and the greatest amount of need, whereas maybe some of the larger provider systems might ha have the capability to make that transition. So. Um, that's another role that we can play. Um, I would just throw back a couple of additional comments after listening today and, and um, what I know to be the challenges in front for this group to be thinking about. Um, as we've already alluded to, the biggest challenge is going to be um, the size of the providers and their capacity to be able to really take on risk and, and move to these um, alternative payment models. Um, and uh, and again, it, it just really is an equity issue. So I think this group really needs to wrestle with how we're going to do that and not lose the richness that um, our smaller providers bring. Um, I think other questions 
our, how we assign value and value to whom needs to be really considered when we think about these payment structures and um, think about from a, a person-centered approach. Um, and then um, how we're going to assess payment. This is something that I have been really worried about as we um, continue to move towards value-based payment structures. We still have a um, a rate setting mechanism that works on a service encounter basis. And so we are already experiencing in our state um, some of the after effects uh, or the effects of what happens when you set rates based on encounters um, and then it, the rates go down and then you can't do the work that you're trying to do. And so how, what, how are we going to um, look at that rate setting and, and attach that to the value payment so providers actually get, get paid what it costs to do business? Um, and then I think from an ACH perspective, I will just um, say that uh, the survey data is great. I know that the state is is working really hard on this, but we are in a very weird um, and awkward position as ACHs, I think, where we have some responsibility in helping to move a system, but um, no, uh, no authority and actually no connection to the relationship between providers and MCOs where the work really happens. And so... Um, how do we get that data? How do we have actually really a clear understanding of what's happening in our region? Who are the providers that are engaged in these types of arrangements and how and how they're progressing over time so that we actually can make really good decisions about how we distribute funds and how we use our incentive dollars to help move the system forward. Um, so again, I think that MCO provider ACH relationship and collaboration will be important, but um, having visibility into what's really happening is going to be important from the ACH perspective. So I will stop there. This is really great. Um, I wonder, do you want to open it up to any comments before the breakout? Sure. Yeah, I mean, we're about to break. Actually, we're, I think we're having a break before our breakout. Um, but we have a few minutes, um, somewhat ahead of, of the schedule since we're one presenter short. Um, any initial thoughts or questions or comments um, for the presenters uh, while they have the, the floor, if you will? Or you can save it for the breakout, but no? Okay. Oh, Rick, go ahead. Yeah, so one of the things that um, lurks in the back of my mind, uh, based on my experience, is um, choosing words. Um, so I, I do represent the independent provider community. And no one knows what proportion of all providers in the state are independent. It used to be banded around that it was somewhere around 40%. That was about 10 years ago. Then I think the um, Washington Alliance did some calculations about five years ago to think that it's more like 25% in the larger Puget Sound area, covering about 3.5 million people. Um, it is not necessarily correlated well with rural versus non-rural. Most of the independents, to my knowledge, are in suburban areas, less densely populated areas. Um, so that's one issue. The other issue is the, uh, the assumptions we make about the ambulatory care systems that are affiliated, my fingers are quoting for those on the phone, affiliated with um, hospital-owned systems. So they are affiliated, they're owned, but they're subsidiaries, there are different legal arrangements there. But the thing that ties them at the waist is the hospital admission. And so if you're a primary care doc in one of those delivery systems, you're feeding the beast, uh, keeping beds full, because we're still predominantly FIFA service. That's what keeps hospitals open. There have been several comments that are very interesting here. Namely, wouldn't it be great if we could pay for what it costs to deliver care? Hospitals, in some cases, are way underpaid for what they're doing. And in other cases, they're way overpaid. And there's no cost accounting in this industry, and so we don't know what it costs to deliver care of any type. You know, it's complex. Um, so we make assumptions about what, let's call them physicians, um, on the large ambulatory clinic side owned by hospitals, they, to my knowledge, in conversations with them, they're pretty blind to what all of what's going on around here. They really don't know what BBP is all about any more than an independent does. They're just told, and their salary is tied to telling. 
So here's your RVO, RVU threshold, meet it or sayonara, or get a deduction for your salary. So the, they, the hospital has levers for production that the independents, you know, in business for themselves don't use or don't have. So again, however, when we think about education, we, we think about alignment to provide access to Medicaid populations. We have to think about what the providers on the hospital loan side know or don't know about what it is we are talking about here and what we're trying to achieve because you know it, it's really in their best interest but it, it's probably not on their radar they're just trying to get to the end of the day intact now the administrators who are making all the decisions about the contracts non-physician administrators choosing what proportion of medicaid load they're going to take or medicare load um, you know, those are financial decisions and they're, they're business decisions and they're pretty cut and dry. And you have to keep a load of FIFA service going while, while you're retooling and re-engineering knowing what's coming as an administrator to your hospital system, which is complex. And it's difficult. It's a very difficult water to, to navigate. So I think we need to broaden our, our, discussions ahead when we think about who needs education where do we need better discussions of alignment it goes back to the survey data what do we need what additional data will we need in order to make more um, coherent decisions around value and payment in different ways for different segments of the population that we're trying to serve. So uh, Mike Dudas, who is not here today, uh, provided uh, some of us a report that was done in New York uh, that looked at how different pediatrics is from adult medicine. I mean, it's, we all know it's remarkably different, but financially it's really different. So it really is germane that we're all talking about maybe two parallel paths of structuring payment for very different kinds of care. Now you take adult populations, you could probably carve adult populations up too. Certainly chronic care is very different than acute. Different costs, different activity, different administrative apparatus required to support it. We need to be thinking about that as well. And I have a question about whether the ACHs are equipped to support that kind of A, education, and B, support to the practices because they haven't had experience there, most of them. It's a very different kind of work. We're, we're beginning to see this in Pierce County. But that doesn't mean that collaboration can't make it work. So how then the question is, how does the ACH work with the medical and behavioral health communities to, be, to create some synergy and, and meaningful support, not create duplication or worse yet confusion so I you know I think your input and from from your different perspectives really raises some really very important fundamental questions about the way forward and how best to to do that so that we don't find ourselves five years down the road in a in a deeper hole in a more complex world uh, with no with no better access to Medicaid patients in particular that's my biggest worry. I'm sure it's yours too, but um, uh, I think this is our opportunity to try to struggle with these questions that are implied by your own perspectives. Thank you, Rick. Um, and I think you raised a couple of good questions that had come about in some of the conversations we had before uh, with some of the presenters, and that is, you know, we, we some of the providers can say, like, you know, I, th I think that this could be a good role for the ACHs, but are the ACHs equipped to do it? Um, and unfortunately, a couple of our ACH representatives that are usually here um, are not today. So we can still punt those questions. We can still ask them, make sure we, we collect them and, and try to get answers to them. Or Susan, you could just answer on behalf of all ACHs. Um, but I think but I think it's a really good question. You know, we can sit here talking about the ACH role and hopefully many of you um, that are representing ACHs here today 
are aware of their expertise and, and can kind of speak to to what they're capable of doing or what their thoughts are and in terms of uh, uh, their role um, in this context. But but I think that you know we don't have to have all the answers today. But it's a good it's a good question to kind of pose to the group as we're going into the breakout session. Can I just make a comment on that? Just just in case, lest there be any confusion, I, I'm not suggesting suggesting that I or my ACH has enough knowledge to educate anybody about this, but I think the role of the ACHs could be to, I mean, we will have funding available through the incentive payments that could, um, you know, broker that expertise to bring in. So we could be a resource for providers to be like, hey, we need somebody that can come in and help us understand how, you know, practice transformation or understand what this means and help to bring that to bear, have um, community resources available, not that we would do it ourselves. No, that's a great point. Go ahead. So I'd, I'd like to maybe just suggest that there's another role, and that would be the role of HCA um, that can help with us. And, and I know that in our region, in our community, and this goes to something that Stacy offered, um, there's, a, I, there's a need for all of us, the consumer level, at the provider level, both the primary care providers and the hospital around where the limits of EMTALA really are. You know, we, we're all struggling, um, you know, with uh, the issue of ER diversion. And we have talked about, you know, what we could do in the areas of, you know, where, what does really triage mean? And, and we've talked about what, what can happen and where we can have that interventions. And there's a, a real wide uh, difference of opinion and understanding about what we can and cannot do. And it's, it's been there forever. It's been there for years. Uh, we've been in community meetings in our ACH, uh, in, in our own communities about um, what kind of intervention are we allowed and what can we do. And it's our, it's our biggest need and it's, you know, it's where we could probably make the biggest bang for the buck, whether we're a small provider or a large provider. And I think that's a role that HCA could really help us with understanding, but it, it's, you know, for the ACH to tell us as providers is not going to be where we can make a difference. Um, the other piece that I that didn't hear that I think um, both in uh, urban and, and uh, rural providers and small providers that I think um, would be really helpful in terms of education is how we could better use telehealth. You know, it's, it's talked about a lot, but I think uh, it's another area in terms of access and edu patient education. And again, we talked about it in the area of ER diversion on how telehealth could be helpful. So just two comments from the comments that I heard today. Thank you. Really? Uh, can, yeah, I, can I interject? Sure, one? sure, sure. We have a couple and then we'll take a break. Here. Yep. So um, referred earlier, Joe made a comment early on that um, I thought was something we had to go back to today because we, we were kind of circling the elephant in the room around data. Um, and, it, and it's everybody's problem. It's it's no one person's problem or one group's or one sector of the industry's problem. Um, so, Joe, you you challenge the 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 quality of the survey data and how you what utility it would have if it's incomplete. Valid question. Uh, it's always the problem in any type of voluntary uh, survey like this. Um, but it's also true of paid claims data. And it's true of clinical data coming out of EHRs, which are non-standard and variously uh, applied, so to speak. Um, and let alone integrating that data at the person level so that you can actually know what's going on. And in that discussion, of course, is the old HIE uh, issue of if I only had this, that, or the other thing, which is usually not HIE related, but it's you know, it's the availability of useful information. Superimpose on that all of the waiver requirements from the feds for uh, HEDIS level uh, uh, quality indicators, which have very little interest to clinical providers. Um, and yet they have the capacity, many of them, have, including independents, have the capacity to produce meaningful um, quality indicators at a clinical level. Uh, particularly in a registry format where you're following types of people with um, the same clinical conditions. So, which is relevant for ACH work and it's relevant for what we're talking about here in terms of managing contracts uh, that have value for everyone. So, I think 
the data issue looms big, we're, we're avoiding it because it's bigger than any of us can think about, and it represents tens of millions of dollars of investment. Um, in an earlier conversation, and I missed it earlier this week in a webinar, New York has experience here, uh, and the magnitude of building a warehouse of this type of information for a state as large as Washington is immense. And who's poning up the bucks for this? Um, and short of it, what can you do? What can you do that actually moves us forward instead of in a larger, more complex circle? Everybody's worried. So um, I'm sure Manette folks have something to say about this uh, in their experience, but it's something, again, we need to be talking about because um, it could be that Yes, in order to get money from the feds, you've got to do X, Y, and Z, but at what cost? And is it really productive? At what point do we begin constructively pushing back with a uh, somewhat modified plan for what it is that we collect? I know that this discussion is going on in the Pierce County ACH, because when you get into projects, and projects that are going to be initiated in that ACH will be coming forward in November, there will be project level evaluations requiring clinical level data and data from agencies who are collecting information about social determinants of health. But who's gonna manage that? This is, this is an issue. And it isn't going to be paid for by the waiver monies, which are gonna come way too late because there needs to be upfront development costs for this, so we need to figure it out. We need a plan, I think, and maybe some recommendations from this group about how we guide forward and make recommendations related to payment that is not going to shoot everybody in the foot because we can't evaluate whether we went in a straight line in the right trend or in another circle. That happy note. <laughs> Okay, I think what we'd like to do is go ahead and get ready for a quick break. Before we do, I just want to talk a little bit about how we want the breakout groups to work. Uh, originally, we were going to have four different breakout groups due to some uh, people who weren't able to make it at the last minute today. We're going to bring that down to three. So the first group will be from Joe North, assuming that that's North. And um, Wait, let me, yeah, do you want me to do this? No, I have <laughs> Okay, you can go. Yeah. Uh, so it'll be from Joe North. The second group will be down here, the three people down here. Uh, and we, what we were hoping is that, Mark, you could come over and join this group here. And then the third group, and I know I have all your numbers wrong, but these are still the three groups. Um, third group will be up there. And Francis, we were hoping you could go ahead and join that group up there. What we want you to do in these breakout groups is talk about what you heard through these various presentations and some of this conversation that has happened afterwards. What resonated with you? what didn't resonate, what do you think you would add to it? Because what we would like to do is have each of these three groups then come up and spend about five minutes talking about uh, how they would alter the list of what can be done or should be done to address the high-hanging fruit and what the ACH role would be in that. And so uh, if we have more than 15 minutes left once we start those sessions, um, then we'll have more open discussion alongside of those as well and allow some question and answer. So when you get into your groups, um, when you come back from break, we hope everybody will be back by 3.15. Determine who's going to be your speaker for that, uh, that report out at the end, and we'll have about 25 minutes in these breakout groups. I'd ask the ACA folks to go ahead and jump in any of the groups uh, that you like and kind of disperse yourself amongst those. Haley and I will be trying to pay a little bit of attention to each of the groups um, and we'll walk amongst them as well. Any questions before break? Look at that, I gave you an extra minute for break too. <laughs>
we get. Okay, I think uh, we're at the time when we should probably be wrapping the break up and starting to get into our breakout groups. Um, we're going to go ahead and get ready to start a 25-minute uh, timer for the breakout groups to get going. So I'd like to please request everybody to uh, go ahead and get in those. I'll, I'll We actually have a timer. Can you hear it? Okay. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it.
just like to say we have a little less than five minutes. Um, please make sure you have your ideas ready to present. Why don't we all just take a minute to wrap up and we'll then start the presentations. Okay, I think we're needing to get started now with the presentations. I think uh, this group up here in the top right here wins uh, as far as being seated, ready to go first. So I'll, I'll give you the choice. You can either go first or pick which one of these two groups you want to go first. <laughs> they are ready. All right, group one, group two. 
Oh no, I'm just trying to get these people up. Okay. <laughs> okay, so do we have any volunteers to go first or are you, you wanna go? We can go. There you go. We have our volunteers. Hi everybody, my name is Kat Latte and I'm an audience member. I'm, I'm the manager of health system innovation at Community Health Plan of Washington, but happy to report out for our group and happy to be included in the small group um, activity. So in the first area, so strategies for bringing other providers into value-based payment, uh, our first portion of the discussion was focused around how the, um, how the ACH, so the, there's sort of some uh, synergy across the two topical areas, but the idea of the recognition that some of the smaller providers, rural behavioral health providers, et cetera, might have uh, different uh, gaps and connections to certain types of uh, provider types that could really support connecting their individuals with social determinants of health. Something that also also came forward is the idea of so building on that, that recognition that smaller providers might not be able to take on many of those FTEs um, and or be able to have some of the systems to actually build out the practice capacity, so IT, data collection, and aggregation. So how might there be either a consortium level at a number of the ACHs or within regions that might allow for some of that connective tissue to be built so that smaller providers might not be able or might not have to shift and be taken on by a larger system or potentially not be able to support the change that they'd like to um, move forward in. Uh, the other component that we brought forward around strategies for bringing other providers into BDP was really just echoing what um, Terry and Dr. Chalmers uh, shared was around um, the necessity to have some investment capital up front that, that would allow those providers to move um, on some of the work forward around value-based payments. So we talked a little bit around the costs of training. Um, something that we touched on was something that Stacy brought up around the revenue loss, around both training time, but also shifting to a value-based payment uh, process just is, is costly. And so what might that investment start to look like? Um, then we started to move into more specifically the ACH's role, and we discussed the utilization of the Milliman data to analyze the cost models at a regional level, and built on that, what capacities the ACH's might have or might not have to be able to use that information effectively. So we talked about how might the healthcare authority help the ACH's break down some of that data to be able to drive targeted interventions that would really be able to address the cost centers that are happening within the regional areas. I think what we're seeing at the ACHs right now is that some of that information is just not in front of us. And so we're maybe not aiming the investments and the interventions that are coming forward within the projects in the right places. And so how might we be able to utilize that data most effectively to really be able to use the um, investment dollars from the demonstration um, most effectively and then uh, move forward on our goals. Another element that came forward was around standardizing social determinant screening tools uh, for communities, so that the role of ACHs in being able to have a discussion about what that standardization might be able to look like. And this then connects to the earlier statement around how an ACH might be able to be a connector um, to some of those uh, social determinant of health services, I'll say in air quotes. Um, I think the other piece that we talked about, again, building on what was said earlier in the presentations, just really emphasizing the role that the ACH would play, Susan spoke to this, around education and capacity assessment for providers um, and recognizing that the ACHs might not have that skill set at this point in time, but how do you leverage the people around the table at the ACH to build out that capacity assessment? and really understanding um, what are those capacity development needs over time. And with that, I was talking about this around on the break and brought it forward in this group, is that I think it's starting to come forward, the role of DISRIP is to really be a bridge for providers to be able to be successful in value-based payment and to be able to invest in those capacities so they can be. However, what we've been doing 
up to now has been really around project specific areas. So bi-directional integration, care coordination, diversion, et cetera. And how are we mapping those project areas to invest in the capacities that we're seeing as necessary to succeed in value-based payment? That hasn't really been present yet in some of the VVP, in, sorry, some of the ACH conversations. So seeing that really as a next step that ACHs and their, their partners might be able to um, provide so that there can really be this um, knitting of value-based payment and, uh, and the demonstration. Anything else, group? Any questions for them? Great, thank you very much, we appreciate it. Who would like to go next? Okay, I'm subbing in for Paul, so. Um, we have three kind of key takeaways from the reaction standpoint and then a few takeaways from the expansion portion. So uh, we've less so focused our conversation on agreement or disagreement and more questions or topics we'd like to drill down further in. So I think you can use that as a takeaway. Um, one reaction was uh, both Joe and I were involved in a conversation this morning uh, with the Olympic ACH and it's clear that most ACHs, whether in this larger convening or in their own individual conversations are all steering towards this. What is the role of the ACH? What functional capacities can we help providers build and support? Um, so that was really reassuring, I think, from our perspective to have the exact same conversation twice in one day. Um, <laughs> other items we'd like to drill down from a reactionary standpoint, uh, how does value get encompassed into the ways in which payers specifically managed care and the healthcare authority are thinking about population-based and whole person care. Um, and then a larger discussion around attribution and empanelment, not losing the nuances of that in this type of conversation. Uh, for the expansion portion, um, we talked a lot about that data aggregation and how many data aggregators are necessary for this work to be functional and operational long-term. Uh, we have zero answers other than not a million. Um, who has the ultimate responsibility in decision making and who are the audiences for value-based contracting discussions? I think that's a large part of kind of what we've circled on is who needs to be present in these conversations and are the people present ultimately the end all audience? Um, what role should the ACH play? Uh, we have two takeaways here, shifting the value-based discussion more around a spectrum for providers and less a writ large only about the capitation of the certain categories of payment models, um, particularly since uh, category two is also included in the roadmap for success. So it's not just only capitation, and I think it's easy to gravitate there because that's where a lot of the weight seems to be and the anxiety, but um, recognizing this is a spectrum and some providers will not ever need to get to category four to be successful. Uh, and finally, we have to recognize that even if the outcomes and the metrics seem off or contradictory to the needs and desires of the ACH, they're still valuable. So that's our group. Any questions for that group? We know who's next. We do. <laughs> so, um, you know, as we talk through kind of the strategies for bringing providers into VVP and ACH's role, it really kind of blurred into really one conversation. And I think there's, as the earlier theme um, in our discussion uh, alluded to, is there's a huge amount of education opportunity, both in terms of the provider community, as well as it sounds like, honestly, our own um, you know, our own uh, boards and, and some of the um, just participants, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. You really can't over-educate enough there. Um, so one of the ACH's opportunities is to go out to community, reach out to some of the smaller uh, provider groups, providers, and educate and then also help to assess their readiness for some of these key areas when we look at data analysis, care coordination, um, chronic disease management, EHRs, all of those things, because not everybody's going to need the same thing. It's, it's, um, it's an opportunity to look at an MSO type option, and perhaps an ACH could get together with 
large, some of the larger providers who have more resources to then say, you know, what can we offer some of these community providers so that they can stay community-based? Um, the other thing is the ACHs, when we look at ultimately what everyone needs to be successful, we really need to look at some of the non-traditional support systems, um, fire, police, jail, schools, housing, food support, transportation. Everyone needs um, to be partnering with those groups in the communities in order to make some of the difference in the social determinants of health. Um, and there's all kinds of uh, ideas that, that came up in that process. Um, and then lastly, you know, at the end of the day, the ACHs are a conduit for the distribution of funds. So it's going to be really important that in the distribution of funds process that the smaller provider groups are um, really considered and have a voice in the distribution of fund flow for each of the regional ACHs so that it makes sense. Because in a small practice, you know, the people wear many hats. And there's just simply not the capital there um, to fund some of this. And so, you know, maybe the weighting of this isn't, um, isn't what one might expect. We need to really be intentional in ensuring that they aren't somehow financially cut out of that discussion. Oh, what else? What else? Anybody else? No, that's it. <laughs> any questions for this group or any takeaways anybody would like to raise? So, I mean, I think that um, there were definitely some overlaps, some agreement with the, some of the presentations, um, clearly some common themes. It's been enlightening. Um, you know, we, we need to still kind of discuss what the, the next step on this is, but a lot of good information discussed today and, and we collected it. I, you know, I know others collected it. Um, so, you know, like last time we prepared this TA uh, for the ACHs, it seems like much of what we discussed would be very helpful for the ACHs, right? Um, and we'll probably raise more questions. So we, we will think about kind of the best forum for, for passing along this information. We, of course, welcome input um, thoughts from you all on, on that uh, kind of moving forward um, and would assume this would be a somewhat iterative thing. You know, if we put something down in slide form or in some form, we would pass it back to you all and say, is this right? You know, what are we missing? Um, because we want all of your brains on this, um, you know, not just today, um, but my, just my two cents on kind of next steps. We'll, we'll circle back with this group um, moving forward. Go ahead, Rick. So, you know, that what's uh, gratifying about this discussion today, I think, is uh, the emerging uh, common threads that keep, some of them repeat and others get refined in their repeating and others are new. And that is the process. Um, I was uh, saying to Emily uh, over the break that over the last few years, I've met lots of people who've come into this industry for the first time. And after a year, they say, I didn't realize how difficult it was going to be. They came in with quick solutions to problems that they could see from the outside. Then they get into the industry. And that's behavioral health or physical health. Same thing. This is daunting. There's no doubt about it. But some of the themes that I think we're, we're saying it in different words. It's coming out in, on different examples or issues, but a central tendency is really important. So we have nine ACHs. We have an HCA. We have, um, okay, I'll say a tepid leadership at the top of the state uh, around healthcare reform, but not oppositional. Um, and we're trying to figure it out while we're flying the plane and um, doing it in a way that gets as much common experience, shared experience, shared knowledge, shared ways of doing things the same way is probably a pretty good outcome of this collective effort. In and amongst, we're doing it around this construct of value-based payment, trying to drive waste out of the system, which means duplication, uh, wasted motion, ineffective results, that sort of thing. And I think that's how you get there. Uh, and as frustrating as a three-hour session in an afternoon on a, on a uh, September 7th could be in these discussions, I think we keep at it. Uh, this is where dog in the bone really helps. Um, if you've got one of those at home, go home to it. So 
you know, it's, it's very, persistence is really important. We are going to make progress. We have been making progress, but we'll keep chipping it away. And I think the way to get there is by here, choosing uh, through additional conversation, the few threads of common theme that have come up, stay with them, dive into them, go out and, and try to build intersections with ACHs and out them out into the community and then upward with the HCA staff, the legislature. These are hundreds of thousands of conversations that need to occur. They don't occur overnight. They don't occur in a soundbite. We have to be persistent. So good work, everyone. We've been at this for three hours. I think uh, in the fairness of traffic and the fact that we have too many people in this blessed area of the country, um, let's get going. So until November 7th, have a great time. <laughs>